Welcome to the Change Makers in Education. It's a global challenge and the United Nations Sustainability, the Sustainable Development Goal. Uh, and I am Deborah Burhanu. I'm an associate professor of uh, material science uh, at the Fashion Institute of Technology and the research associate uh, in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the American Museum of Natural History. I am honored to moderate this afternoon's panel of uh, change makers in education. To me, education is the only key to real sustainability. Education fosters the understanding uh, of the other, understanding of the environment that's around us, an understanding of our symbiotic existence and the fact that your well-being is mine and that the Earth's well-being is ours. Survival of the fittest sounds easy enough and many who actually misunderstand it will cite it as the scientific concept to explain injustices around the world Sustainability is more complex, yes, yet it's the science behind it that is actually relevant to the advanced societies that we are, or at least aspire to be. So sustainability speaks of a symbiotic relationship uh, between economic, societal, and ecological developments. So it is not a surprise that the fourth of 17 goals set by the United Nations to achieve sustainable development is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities. This afternoon, I am e-meeting, and I wish it was in person, uh, with three women with different perspectives and a different approach to empowering others. So please welcome Asmaret Berhe Lumax, a fashion and beauty executive and activist and founder of One Love Community Fridge, Galila Bekele, model, social activist, and filmmaker, and Dr. Tian Shiros, assistant professor in the Department of Math and Science at the Fashion Institute of Technology and the research associate at Columbia University and co-founding scientific director of Werewolf. And welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, who are here with us today. So before we start our discussion, I would like us to watch together a short clip of an all-female crew. Uh, it's a documentary directed by Galila Bagala, My Life is Not Honey. The documentary is a snapshot in the life of young girls in a rural village of Ethiopia and the role climate change plays in gender inequality.
So thank you, Galila, for accepting to be here uh, with us today. And I wanted to ask you, um, could you please explain? I really like the title, as I told you. Could you please explain the title to everyone to start with? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the, the title Mai means uh, water in Tigrinya. And I kept hearing it, and it just has this beautiful sound as water does naturally. Uh, and it was kind of like a word play with uh, the mother saying, no matter how many cattle and no, many, no, no matter how much land you have as a woman, meaning where she lives, um, women's life, young girl's life is, is, a, is not honey, which means it's not sweet. It's a metaphoric language. So I thought putting those two together for me sounded really good <laughs> in describing this sweet um, family. It, it really touched me when you explained the, the word because I, I don't speak it to Grigna either. And, and that was really uh, telling of uh, how you played with the words as well. And so can I ask you, what made you think of um, education? How did you choose this family? What made you think of education? Uh, to help others. Um, I, you know, I, I was born in Ethiopia, but grew up most of my life sort of outside of uh, the country and mostly in Europe and in America now. Um, and I've gone back many years, especially in the rural part, just so I can learn about my culture, about my people, who I am in more of in a DNA level and uh, just understanding my culture and I thought the best place was to be in the rural parts of the world and rural parts of Ethiopia particularly and um, 
and I just constantly saw that there were more boys in class than girls. And I, you know, naturally, as you think, okay, maybe we, we make it more um, <clears throat> appealing for girls to come to class. So uh, we sort of like started building these small classrooms and um, kind of putting some, some effort in making the classrooms better with the schools that already existed. But the more and more I realized, like it did not matter. There was just the disparity and the chores these young girls have to do daily to, <clears throat> they walk for, for five, four to five hours on average a day to fetch water. And this is what mostly kept the girls away from classrooms. So, you know, partnering up with Charity Water and building these waters in near one of the schools there was like 80% increase within six months. And then you realize like, you know, these stories sort of resonated for me for everything else and echoed for everything else. And, you know, I sort of think like, why are some certain parts of the world impoverished and have less resources? And you realize climate change is a huge driving force in, in these complex uh, stories and disadvantages and you know these are pastoralists people who live off the land these are indigenous people who are not just going to abandon and move away because there's more rain in another part of ethiopia or part of the world and what better way to really understand who they are um, so i really would go and just spend time uh, not just only in in the north of ethiopia but in the south um, in the west and in the north and there was a very common factor in education for me when I looked at it. There were a lot more women who took uh, more initiatives in, in bettering their lives when they have a higher education than those who didn't. Um, health and sanitation. And then just also for the next generation, if, if I am educated as a mother, most likely my children are going to attend school. Um, so I, I thought the education was such a common thread in everything. Um, so that's, that's how it all started. And they, the family really found me. I was being lazy after climbing a little hill and out of breath. And I sat under a tree and watched these beautiful women just walk by with their umbrellas, you know, going out about their day. And this little girl, Hambar, which is one of the sisters, and ran and just kind of started a conversation with me and asked me to follow her to have coffee with her mom. And I went and, and it was, and I realized the mom I actually met when I was walking down the hill. She was one of the gorgeous women that took my breath away. And it just was like very natural. And, um, all that was important to have a women's perspective in this. And um, I was lucky enough to have friends who or just understanding on, on a human level, you know, and trying to understand our world more on the human level versus making this abstract art and capturing this family. And uh, that female perspective was so important relating to these female stories and young girl stories. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And, uh, you know, when you say about uh, global warming, one thing that's really surprising is um, uh, the, the idea that uh, we don't regenerate resources as much as we use them and how the population is growing is actually quite old. And the first writings we find is about the 1780s, the, the first, uh, you know, uh, writings about this more than almost 250 years ago. And yet we still struggle to, to feed uh, people and, and get water um, around the world, but also locally. And, um, and, and this is what I'd like to uh, ask Marat, can, can you tell us, uh, especially in the current pandemic, we're going backwards uh, in terms of all the progress that were made. Uh, so uh, could you tell us how did you come up with this idea of creating the, the community fridge? I, I really am a fan of, of of this uh, and how you came up with that but could you could you tell us how you came up with that idea well i mean i first i want to say that um i did not come up with idea like okay. i it's it's not it's it's i've literally just joining a movement that's been around for a long time um and it's been so many people that have been doing this work for a long time i think with 
just with COVID-19 and the pandemic that hit this year, probably just like accelerated it and uh, invited more people into this. And I think including myself, because my end of um, the support has before was, you know, participating and volunteering with food banks and food pantries. I think when, um, in terms of the community fridges, uh, even in the beginning, we would go, we would, uh, uh, along with uh, friends of ours, go and volunteer at food banks and would see and like, you know, lines get longer and longer and actually the food running out. Um, and even like having like organizations that are pretty big organizations now having to put restrictions on families in terms of the food that they can, uh, how many times they could come to the food pantry. And I think the other thing that I would see was um, a lot of the food, unfortunately, wasn't the best, not that healthy. And I think um, and that kind of all ties into then, um, actually uh, a good friend of ours that lives in Harlem, she set up one of the first ones in New York. And when I heard about that, I was just like, this is amazing because we have this problem now that we've had it for a long time, but it's more than ever in terms of um, people that have to um, seek help to be able to feed themselves and their families. But at the same time, we also have to realize like, we have an enormous amount of food being wasted. Like about, I think it's 40% of all the food that's being produced just in the US alone is wasted every year. At the same time, you have millions of families that are food insecure. In, in, in US, we have 48 million Americans that are food insecure. In New York alone, it's 1.3, and they estimate the numbers to go up to 2 million this year. And with that, just like locally, because this is not just a, it's not just a problem that exists across the world in Africa, like it exists here, like in our backyards, in our front porch, it's like in our communities. And Brooklyn alone, which is where I live, is, is the highest borough, uh, has the highest number of food insecurity in, in New York. And, and then if you can, you can look at the numbers even further down and you look at the numbers and what does that mean for, for families and kids? One out of five children in New York have to rely on uh, soup kitchens and food pantries to feed themselves. Um, so for me, it's like, you know, it's again, like, you know, we talk about education, how important it is to, you know, to be able to have opportunities. But even if you provide the best of education, just like Galila said now, you know, even if they build schools, people are not gonna be able to go to the schools and take advantage of the education if they can't even feed themselves. Because at the end of the day, you know, you know, food is health and food is how, you know, through food and water, that's how we nourish our bodies. And I think with the pandemic, this is a problem that's existed for a long time, but, you know, with the pandemic this um, past year is also open eyes for a lot of other people that may, may a lot of people that for the first time have to seek help to be able to feed themselves. Uh, but it's also very clear, like how reliant we are on, on our health to be able to live a life and then how much our food impacts our health. Um, so the Community Fridge is an amazing initiative and it's like, it's an amazing movement. I think in New York now, where there's over 90 fridges that popped up over this year. And it's, it's a huge community of people that's supporting in different ways. And we see, you know, fridges popping up throughout the country. Uh, so there's like one part of it, it's like, you know, the immediate need for people to feed themselves. But then there's a longer term, and that's what with like with One Love Community that we really want to focus as well in terms of not just food, but also healthy, fresh food to make sure that we don't that we're able to break free from this loop of like um, poverty, unhealthiness that then leads to unemployment or being un, you know not being able to educate yourself and. Um, I think I'm like I'm starting to ramble a little, but it's all the the, the thing is like it's all it's at the end of it, it's all it's all connected. Um, and at the end of it, I think as human beings, we all have the right to food and healthy food. Um, and I think uh, that's what we, we're just trying to make sure that what, what we can do or whatever we can to make sure that everyone has had access to it. It's true. And, and I think, especially in, in terms of university as well, it's, it's really relevant. Like a, a lot of times students are actually a very big part of, of people who, who need help. Uh, and uh, as the pandemic arrived, that was uh, one of the biggest population who needed these, these food banks. Yeah. Uh, and 
what I really like about these fridges and when I look at them is like it's a home fridge. I find it really uh, dig dignifying in what it's offering. And I think that's really what made the difference for me and, and um, in terms of helping, we're not just giving what we don't want because a lot of times what goes into the food banks is really the unwanted products, the canned food, the processed food. Uh, and here you're offering something and you're teaching them as well because one of the biggest problems in these areas is that people do not know how to cook because it has been forgotten because as we as galila was saying earlier it's the mothers that pass on these type of education the the the, the cooking the what goes as a preparation so what do you think about that in terms of so social justice and yeah i mean there's definitely a couple aspects that you touch upon i mean number one i think the amazing thing about the community fridges is that it's a community effort it's it's uh it's uh it invites local communities to participate and the idea of you know mutual aid and working together and it's not about me giving you it's you know giving each other I'm giving you you giving me back it's a two-way exchange and I think that's the that's almost the number one most important thing it, you know which is slightly different from food pantries where people have to come and stand in line and wait for the turn but this is a way to really you know invite everyone to be a part of uh, the, the solution. And then, and then I think the other part is yeah, absolutely because unfortunately a lot of food pantries might not have the, the distribution logistical setup to be able to really um, provide fresh food. Um, and it usually it's, it's also, it's also the, the communities that rely on food pantries are the ones that are most vulnerable that actually really need <laughs> the food, uh, the 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 fresh food, because um, you know you know we can go into like food deserts and what that means and you know you know completely um, unless you have the financial means or the time to uh, you don't have access uh, to any fresh and healthy food and that kind of ties into the whole loop of like okay so then who gets sick and when they get sick what happens are they going to be able to get healthier or not, or like, if you're not able to get healthy, are you able to, you know, still work? And can, can, you, can you, you know, are you able to provide for your family? Um, so I think uh, the the community fridges, is, it's is just amazing um, initiative in terms of creating independence, allowing for communities to come together, to work together uh, and making sure that, you know, well taken care of um, and, um, I think the other thing that's also really important is that it also allows for the food that is in the fridges to be culturally appropriate, depending on where the fridges are placed. Because I think that's another part too, that you know, it invites people to, again, like you said, coming in and you know, if you need using the fridge, you can take, you know, take what you need, what works for your family, what works for your, you know, for your diet, and then also invites you to share, you know, and I've seen it's so many times that this is such a beautiful community that many of people that uses the fridge are also the people that are part of providing for the fridges as well. Um, so again, like it's, yeah, there's the, the respect, there's dignity, and it's about health. Um, I'm going to then ask um, Tian uh, uh, to join us here. So Tian, you are actually the one who made this happen. Okay, so uh, uh, I remember talking to Tian and telling her how I, I watched Galila's um, documentary and how it talked to me living here, not just because I'm from East Africa, but living here. And by coincidence, Asmarat and Tian were working on the same project and that's how all this actually came, came together. Uh, and, uh, but what really touched me is the finding of the well, the, just like uh, Asmarat, you found this idea of helping people in a different way. We've been trying to teach science to, to those who don't actually go into science. So Tian, how do you think we can, like, you, I remember you and I talked about this and how much it's, uh, it's, it speaks to us in terms of finding the well and how we struggle to get science into, uh, uh, in, into the education of minorities. Uh, tell me, how do you teach science? Um, wow, okay. So um, how do I teach science? I think that, I think teaching science is like teaching anything. And 
um, it's just about moving barriers. So I can tell you a small anecdote which brought me to where I am now, which was that I, I when I finished college, I had done art history, and, but I really wanted to do physics. I was passionate about the environment. I was insatiably curious. I was somebody who constantly wandered and wondered and was fascinated by the beauty and efficiency of nature and really heartbroken by what uh, the, the tragedy, the true tragedy in the Greek sense of what humans were doing, their own doing to the planet and each other because of the disproportional effects on marginalized communities and women and children of our pollution and our climate. So I wanted to work on renewable energy. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, if I go back to school for physics to get a PhD, it's 10 years. And, you know, long story short, I made myself into a program. I left many times crying. I was sure I didn't have the capacity. Eventually I got into a PhD program in chemical physics at Stanford. And I, I went to Engineers Without Borders to put in a school because I, it was to electrify a village in Bayonne in the Northern part of Haiti to put in a school. And it spoke to my, my passions on many levels. It was community oriented. It was renewable energy. That renewable energy was gonna allow kids to go to school. This was a place where the school started 13 kids under a mango tree. Uh, and then we put in a three kilowatt solar system um, as a team, Engineers Without Borders. And today I can say 1400 kids go to that school, half of them are girls. Now, when we got there, it's the same way I feel at FIT. How do you teach science? In every classroom, I'm the 25, a classroom of 25, I'm the 26th teacher and the 26th student. It's where are you, what is, everyone has something a little bit different in their way. But when I got to Haiti, there was an accident and school was closed that day. There was a tap tap accident and one of the government officials died. So school was closed. Every single kid walked five miles to go to school to teach each other. That was the passion and that, that wish to, for education that I had when I tried to study physics and I'd fall asleep with my books on my chest and wake up and pick them up again. And where I said, do I have the capacity? Am I smart enough? Is it possible? I don't think I can do this. And when I asked the kids what they wanted to do next, so we had impromptu school because they showed up, they were teaching each other physics, we made a school day. But when I asked them, you know, what will you do next? What would you like to do? They say, they will go as far as they can with education if they have the capacity. And it was so much the same as what I felt as a girl in New York who had been working in an art gallery, like, do I have the capacity to, to realize something that's a dream in education. So now we fast forward, <laughs> but what that trip really, really taught me is, is everyone has their own barriers. And sometimes you remove your own, sometimes you, some, a mentor removes them for you, sometimes a generation of women or leaders before you remove them without you knowing. And so how I teach science <laughs> um, is I really try to connect with my students and try to understand what barriers they might be having to learning science because FIT students generally um, they're they're obligated to take a science class now I have repeat offenders that come back for science but they have to take one science class and you know that when I ask what they want to get out of the class they're like I'm really bad at science I mean 60 70 percent of the classes I'm really bad. and you know I tell them I don't let's see I don't believe it let's see and so I think it's about like teaching it in context I mean you know this, these bubbles I'm blowing, that's their demonstration. These were this student's project and it was about ocean acidification. And they did a whole chemistry demonstration showing how the ocean is becoming acidic from climate change. And I mean, I think that's a, that's a wonderful photo you chose because I think it's like when you're free, when you feel that you have the capacity, you're, you, you start to like what you can do is more and more. So I think the biggest thing for teaching science is is just to really try and um, and let my students know that I, you know I was there too, and you know people helped me remove barriers. So let's and and in context, you know, if you you have to teach chemistry in context, you find out what they care about, and then you connect to it. For me, all three of you had this um, ability to just remove barriers and also make it in a way that is dignified. That, that, that's really the world that stays for me. You, you, you have chosen paths that really um, shows how you're, you're striving to make other people better uh, because their betterment is your betterment. And, and it, it really speaks to sustainability for all, all your actions. Um, so 
having worked with you, Tiana, I know how much you work with the students' project, but you actually take them to a whole new level of sustainability. They sustain themselves beyond college uh, by getting a job, by, get, by, by creating companies like you do. So uh, it's really beyond the, the, the normal level that, that, that you, 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 you teach. Um, and one thing that, we, that, uh, that I like is, uh, so we see Tian in the classroom and then we see Tian in a village somewhere. Uh, and so tell us, what's the difference between the two, Tian? <laughs> Very little. Very little. I mean, you go there, you understand the local resources, the local needs, same as at FIT. What local resources do we have? What local needs need to be met? You, this is Modia, it's a beautiful village, beautiful women, full of song and spirit, lush, filled with natural resources. 60% um, live well below the poverty line and over 60% don't have access to water. And so, but there's this, you know, a bit of change. So what, this is a natural dye workshop. They're, um, they recently started having um, improved agriculture. The land is really lush. And so from those fruits and vegetables after cooking or using them, we worked, we went out together and we saw what was there and we explored it and we found out what could you dye with. And I think similar to FIT, it's like, what do you connect with? Um, you know, can you, how do you teach chemistry of, of the ocean where you can connect to something you care about? How do you teach the chemistry of natural dyes? Well, it, there's a like, and why? Well, there's a really beautiful, rich tradition of textile arts all through Africa, especially West Africa. Um, and so it's, I think I approach it in the same way. I would say on all of these trips, I'm the student also um, learning about what's there. And I think it's, it's, it's community driven. It's really like, what can we do together? And from my point of view, education and community can really transform lives. It transformed mine, it continues to transform mine. Um, and I mean, this is, these are on the left, it's indigo, the center, you see onion skins. Um, we made an entire collection over 120 colors, 14 dye baths from onion skins, eggplant skins, avocado pits and skins, marigolds that grew wild, indigo that grows wild. Um, and so I think going back to the dignity is that you, you can carve your own way if you have a few barriers removed, right? You know, it's just like you go, you spend some time and say, hey, look at all that you have here. Let's let's do something fun with it today. And th then, you know, same as at FIT, it, it's, it's like a fire because that, that it's the idea that things are somehow now possible and you, you, it's very celebratory. And, and the women then continue to engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning after the workshop and we're, we're testing different things out. And I was getting to learn about their folding techniques. Um, so I think it's, it's just that, that, that dignity and community. Um, and I think this is something really important about education and we see it with Kalila and Asmarat as well, is that um, it's not always formal education. It doesn't have to be the formal education that removes the barriers. It can be, you know, education on food, food deserts with this fridge, education on how much impact community can have by getting together for small projects that grow. And in, in the very similar type of uh, imaging, um, I, I was, uh, I really like these images that, that keep coming, uh, but uh, Galila, in, so you, you've done a lot of things, just like Tian, you, you go from one thing to the other, but in this, uh, you have a book, a uh, photographic book, can I call it? A photo book? Photo can book, you yeah. tell us about these dresses? <laughs> so I, I was, I really liked it, obviously, from my perspective, for, for in terms of sustainability, it really joins to what we just saw in different ways. That's why I wanted you to... Uh, yeah. To tell us more. I don't know. I, I think this kind of existence, when I say this kind of existence, this sort of like living off the land existence for me is the epitome of sustainability, right? I think that word sustainability has become such, you know, business model, political model, a social model that kind of have lost the context and lost its purpose at times. Um, again, when I made that book, it was truly for me. I was pregnant and I couldn't travel too much anymore. And I was like, what can I do in my downtime? And put this book together of like, um, 
collections of stories I've collected again from my travels and my curiosity. Um, and this is from the Hummer in the south of Ethiopia, southern part of Ethiopia. And just remarkable tribe. Um, as you see, um, most of it is beaded and celebrated with beautiful colors. Um, it's a goat skin, a lamb skin. Um, the image on the left um, has a, a calabash, which is uh, a type of uh, vegetable or not, depending who's arguing. <laughs> some people say it's a nut, some people say it's a vegetable. You kind of hollow out. It's kind of like a pumpkin. Um, and you curve it out and, and, and the exterior is kept to kind of contain water or spices. And it keeps the, you know, just it gives the, the water or liquid, whatever you're drinking, such a beautiful flavor and temperature. Um, and again, everything is really from the environment, including the beading and um, sort of like uh, even the uh, the jewelry you see, it has a purpose. Copper is to balance your energy and chi and movement. Uh, there's a skin scarring, which is meant for medicinal purpose. Uh, the image on the right, uh, there's a shoe kind of a uh, sandal sort of that's made of old car tires, which uh, Debra in, in re reminded me is called better bustle, which is a, a beautiful word I used to love saying when I was a kid because the complexity of saying it, I thought it was always funny. Um, yeah, I mean, everything has a purpose. I think um, when we use the word sustainability, and I think Tian said it beautifully, is that for me, when I go there, it's such a huge learning tool. I think we think we are so advanced living in the West. We think we're so much better off, uh, but we realize that, are we really? I don't know, for me, it made me question, you know, does this technological advancement, does that really mean adv advancement of the human race? Um, because everything is so connected. You know, I, I think we, you know, most people will see this and say, oh, I see poverty because they're barefoot, it's dust. But is it really? Don't we take vacations to, to put our feet in the sand and feel the dust and be in nature? For us, that's a vacation. This is way of life. Yes, there is certain disadvantages, sort of education and certain type of resources, but we have them as well. I mean, as Maret is, fighting against that to to make sure people have fresh food and vegetables which were so far removed in the west and we think we're so advanced that everything has to be packaged and refrigerated um and then when i am in this sort of indigenous environment every you, you pick a mango from a tree and you eat it you know it's good because it just grew there and there's no preservative uh, you can live off the land but i think also there's so much that's happened from way of life in the past and where we are now. Uh, someone told me this beautiful story about the monarch butterflies who migrate from Canada all the way down to Mexico in a small town, Mexico, and they stay there. And, in, and that the next migration is almost like and the next generation that migrate back to Canada. But because the demand for avocados from the US is so high that they're cutting these trees and fl flowers and plants that these butterflies would call home for a few seasons are now becoming this avocado plantation. So we're pushing out these magnificent creatures who are natu their natural behavior is to migrate from the north to, to Mexico and leaving all sort of traces in between, right? Helping certain plants bloom so if we can have a few type of fruits and, and all of these natural cycle that happen. And I see that the same with human, the human race, you know, whatever pollution that is happening on this side, whatever technological advancement is happening on this side that is contributing to whether we acknowledge it or not, global warming and all sort of changes that's happening in the environment affects not only us right now, right here, but 
worlds apart, hours apart, geographically such vast, there's so much that's happening. It's so connected to each other. We don't realize it. So when we're talking about sustainability, sometimes it gets lost, especially in the fashion world. It kind of makes my stomach knot whenever I hear the word because like everything else, I think the context, the purpose and the reason behind it, it's more important than the word. I think it's become this marketing tool that designers and fashion houses and brands are using. So they're not called out because we are in this moment in culture that we're just calling out people and holding people accountable, which is really beautiful as we should hold each other accountable. But I think we also need to know the effort behind it. We need to know the context behind it. Um, it's sort of like someone mispronouncing my name wrong, which happens all the time. But what makes it beautiful for me is to see if the person actually tried or not. You know, there are people who are gonna offend me because they don't care. I'm not gonna hold that in the same scale as someone who really tried and and my name comes from a different part of the world that has in normal syllables and vowels that might be foreign to this person. And I will absolutely hold them in the best regard because they tried. And I think for me, sustainability is the same. You have to understand, you can't just dump aid and say we are working on a sustainable initiative not considering what you could learn from whatever part of the world you're pr producing in, not, not learning from that society and just bringing and dumping without having this sort of cultural learning exchange. It's so dangerous. I think that leaves such a, a long-term damage in, in my opinion. And what Tian has done is a beautiful example of this cultural exchange, knowledge exchange of these two worlds could really exist together. Science is beautiful when you when you respect nature and you can work with it. Nature is really beautiful and it also has effort of science. So I mean for me I exist in this in this mentality and I could be wrong, but it feels yeah. good for me. <laughs> <laughs> so Asmarat and Tian are actually working on a project. So can you tell us about this? Exactly. I really like uh, this exchange that you have with uh, West Africa. And I know you've done this back and forth and you will be having an exhibition. Can you tell us about it, please? Yeah, Where uh, can we see it? The, 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 the exhibition um, is funded by the National Education Association. It was supposed to be a physical exhibit. Um, but it's now virtual. It is called 6,876 kilometers, which is the distance from the garment district in Manhattan to the village of Modia, where we worked with the women and other artisans. But it is also the distance that almost 7,000 kilometers is the distance women and girls walk on foot every six seconds around the world collecting water. Um, so this is really um, a love letter to community and to nature and to education. It is an education project rooted in dignity, cultural heritage, community. It celebrates the identity of all the makers of a naturally dyed zero waste collection of garments from start to finish, from the people who donated in fabric in New York City to the students who helped me scour and prepare it, to all the women by name and photo, every, every maker, every single person in the supply chain, um, their story is told, the hands, the hearts, and the minds behind the zero waste collection. And I think it's, it's meant to, um, as a model for um, how education and partnerships can transform lives, but it's also a model for uh, sustainable economic development and empowerment and access to education um, really rooted in local needs and resources and realities. Um, so I, I think this is an ode to removing barriers. Um, as Murat, has been a partner on the project. Um, and yeah, please check it out. It will launch around Earth Day, um, around the same time as this, as very Thank you. And sorry, did you want to say something, Asmarat? No, my, my computer oh, okay. is closed for a second, sorry. Okay, it's okay. <laughs>
sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. So um, I wanted to finish with, with one uh, uh, aspect of uh, education and sport. Uh, to me, sport really comes in lots of ways. Of course, there's the health part of it, uh, that's obvious. But there's also the fact that we learn. We learn from sports uh, taking initiative, not being afraid of taking initiative. And in uh, men's education, sports like uh, soccer, uh, football for most of us, but soccer um, in America uh, or American football, any of these sports uh, actually that will push people to take initiatives, to, to fail at their initiatives and take back another initiative. So it encourages men in general uh, to, to build this type of relationship with their peers. Uh, for women, it's always left behind. And I've seen that uh, Galila and Asmarat, you've been involved in um, Girls Gotta Run uh, organization. They are absolutely amazing. I checked their website. It's uh, can you tell us about this? What, what does sport, why is this uh, organization important to you? Uh, and, and, and tell me more about sport and what it means to you in, in education. Lila, <laughs> do you wanna start? You, you go ahead. Okay, I think uh, for me, uh, and for us, we're fortunate enough to be able to uh, be a part and support Girls Gotta Run because it's it's a it's an amazing organization. Um, like you mentioned, it's uh, it uses sport as a tool for empowerment. And yes, obviously the the first kind of benefits is health, but it comes with so much more in terms of you know independence, it's education, it's you know again opportunity. And I think just for myself as a as a runner and knowing what running has you know, meant to me, uh, it's incredible to see and just be honored to be part of an organization that um, are doing, like taking life-changing steps. Um, in this, uh, Girls Got, their work is mainly in Ethiopia and in Ethiopia, like running is a national sport. So it's, it's, a, it's a sport of honor. So for the women to also be able to take their place and then not only use that, you know, to, you know, for confidence, but also as a tool to get education and also be able to support, um, you know, provide uh, for, for families in the future, for their own families. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, and again, I think that ties into what we talked about sustainability uh, and what does sustainability really mean? You know, uh, there's a very whitewashed idea of what sustainability means, like, you know, slap organic on, um, on a fabric or a lettuce, but what does it really mean? And like the, 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 what, the one converse, conversation that we have all the time between me and Galila is also like, okay, but then sustainability and for who? And for us, this like, this, you know, sustainability in this case is like, this is an organization that is working locally had local partners, uh, the coaches, the trainers, the teachers are all local. And the idea is not to just like, okay, we're gonna set up the school or have these uh, girls run and just hopefully they'll become these uh, international um, athletes. But the idea is we're like, no, the, the running is just one tool for healthy living. But then how do we create a, like a sustainable ecosystem that also works for the family? Because what does it mean if the girl it no longer is helping, you know, the family in terms of at the market or getting the water. If, if she's in school, what does that mean for the family? And how is the family then going to be able to um, sustain a living? Uh, and then there's a different initiative that goes into that in terms of the coffee farming. There's like a micro loan system, like the mothers have um, an organization together that they support each other. So again, like for me, that's what sustainability look, looks like. It's, you know, it's providing a community that allows everyone to live a healthy, a dignified life and be able to support themselves. Um, so that's why, you know, that's why I love Girls Gotta Run. And also like, uh, just to add on what Asmaret said, it's an ecosystem. Mm. You, know, you have to really look at everything um, around um, the situation and the environment before you uh, present a solution. Um, I think having 
understand what the environment and the, the tradition requires of young people, especially girls, is so important before we advance into here's an opportunity. You know, you have situations like early age marriage. You know, you have to kind of figure out how to dismantle that. You have to have a conversation with local leaders and parents um, why the shift matters. Um, it's just so much uh, that goes into planning, but that's what it is. You need to invest in energy, not just only in resources and understanding. And I think having by a coach for the girls that is from that village, um, keep in mind this village is called Bikoji in the kind of Southwest of Ethiopia in the Oromia region, it has 28 gold medals just from that village alone because running is literally a way of life. Maybe I'm the only East African that doesn't run. I'm like, why? <laughs> why should I make myself miserable? <laughs> no. We're <Or> two. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it was quite beautiful for us to be there. And because although we are, you know, Habesha, Eritrean, Ethiopian women, uh, we, we still in the, we live in the West. We are still foreigners, so we have to understand the day-to-day -day activities and the day-to-day -day practices that we are not facing here that they live with. Um, so I think it's been it was really quite beautiful to be there and learn certain things. Like I had no idea what um, what is it the cappuccino that was made of uh, butter and coffee peanut. So there's a lot of peanut that grows and coffee originates from that area. Even the name coffee comes from the region Kefa. Yeah, so it's the origin of coffee. So they have this whole formula of like different type of coffee and how to prepare it, and, you know, mixing it with nuts and whipping it and making it like a peanut whipped coffee, which everybody was like loving, which is vegan. And also, when we got there, um, they just completed their first um, 100 mile marathon. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of recovery that needed to be done. And that was one of the, because, you know, it provides a protein and it's, it's, a, it's an amazing recovery. Um, yeah. 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 And then it was beautiful to see yeah. the girls run past all the foreigners, which is us and all the runners that went, come back and cheer for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It was pretty beautiful. <laughs> and also for mm -hmm. us parents, you know, we are, Asma and I have kids and just to show them that we don't only look to the West for solutions and advancement, but the continent yeah. of Africa. I mean, it actually reminds me of when you were talking about the monarch, uh, the butterfly, and even now, uh, I think a moment that we've had with the, with the fridges and the food here, again, like, you know, time, because it's, it's, it's a global thing. It's not just, you know, something that happens over there. Um, and like, just in terms of like food justice, because uh, one of the other things is like um, living wages and fair conditions for the farmers. Because I think one of the things that hit me now, it's one thing to read the numbers in terms of food wastage, but then when you actually see it, and mind you, I think the work that we do, and it's such a small scale, and if you look at the whole, like oh, everything that's like being done, but to see the number of food that we rescue, like, because on a week, you know, it, it could be somewhere between 4,000 to 5,000 pounds, and realize how many families this food will, um, feed when this food was basic there's nothing wrong with this completely amazing I mean you've seen the images it's majority of it is organic or locally uh, grown would just would have been wasted and to realize then that their farmers especially during the pandemic that risk their lives to ensure that we have the food in stores that then for some reason because it's not you know um I don't know. It doesn't look That's right. It's it doesn't not aesthetically right. and consumer in time when there's nothing wrong with it. It's just going to be discarded. To me, even though there's a there's a oh I'm sorry there's a there's I'm so sorry. Hold on. <laughs> well, maybe I'll let I'm her sorry. finish. The fact that um, yeah, I'll just quickly like the fact that you have people risking their lives, many making many making minimum or below minimum wages 
for this movement of organic food that then it's like a lot of it is then being wasted that's not sustainability um so having to think about that too like what does it mean what is sustainability and like who does it benefit how do we make sure that everyone benefits benefits from it sorry well i want to say thank you all i still have a lot of things to ask you i still have a lot of things that i would like to uh talk to all three of you about to be honest with you uh but i guess uh we're going to be late so i'm going to have to ask the 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 rest of the participants to join us if they have any questions very silent bunch not used to it they're very silent exactly hey delphina you're muted Oh no, I was okay. Hi. Hi everyone. Sorry, I'm now. Um, I just wanted to hear uh, from you guys if there is any advice that you would give um for someone that wants to replicate like some of your projects in other parts of the world. What what is something that uh you would advise uh for someone that wants to start a project? I don't know. If it makes sense, yeah. I think so. Does it, do you have a specific area, maybe a topic that you are more interested in, or any? I mean, just creating workshops uh, around sustainability. Um, but I think any project, yeah. Okay. Galila, do you have an idea? Um, hello, Delfina. Um, I I think it also depends where. You, where this place is uh, and what's needed and what could be learned from the existence that already exists there. I always refer to um, start with the human story, kind of talking to and having conversations with whatever place this might be um, and just seeing what sort of expertise that you could share um, with the locals and sort of input they have and what you can learn from them. And I always find that being the, the best base that's worked for me in the past. And then it takes a life of its own. I feel like a simple, small conversation practice uh, grows to being something really amazing and big. I think also- My experiences you have, sorry. No, sorry, Deborah, go ahead. <laughs> from my experience, there's a lot of things, including in arts, um, like uh, one of my favorite Ethiopian artists is uh, Elias Sime. You can check him. It's uh, he, he does some really great art. He had an exhibition very close to FIT about a year and a half or two, maybe two years ago now. Um, and he basically recycles uh, computer uh, wastes, like literally the wires. The, uh, and I actually use it as a slide for my lectures to show how you have to zoom in to understand what it is. From far away, it just looks like a painting. Uh, but when you actually get close, you realize it's literally the computer components, the hardware that he's transformed into these uh, satellite looking maps. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, so it, it, I think a lot of times people would be surprised to understand how much there is in terms of sustainability because uh, third world countries have to use their waste. Waste is a resource. And until lately, uh, when you know a lot of industrial uh, uh, habits were thrown at them, they actually had to have their own ways to, to use and, and recycle things. So I think there's a lot to be learned uh, in, in diverse areas, diverse topics. I would add to that, I think find a partner who understands the mission and the goals uh, and the the challenges, but thinks differently from you. Um, so has a different perspective. So I can say like on this project with the natural dyes, you know, it's there you come up with co uh, complications. As Marat, like I came in an educator, scientist, you know, interested in development, interested in, in this. But as Marat has this amazing perspective on global supply chain and fashion production and what's, you know, so she was wonderful counsel on where can I make impact? Am I, am I doing this? You know, like just a sounding board and perspective. And I have the pleasure of, of Deborah being my colleague. And, you know, it's the same when we try to start a project, you know, I think having a partner that balances you but under, understands what you're trying to do 
and is supportive of it, doesn't have to have the same commitment to the project as you, you can drive it, but that understands what you're trying to do, what the challenges are, and 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 kind of gives you a, a counterpoint. Um, so yeah, I think I'm very grateful to the women, the women in my life and the community that have really, uh, you know, it, nobody does anything alone ever. And some people get direct credit and some people just are the silent force behind each other, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else has a question maybe? Can I see everyone? Yes. No, do you have any questions for each other? No, okay. Well, thank you everyone for having uh, come to listen to uh, these three ladies. Uh, thank you, uh, Galila, Tian, Asparat. Uh, thank you so much for accepting this. And it was a pleasure for me and an honor to have you all uh, and to very soon, I hope, in person so we can hug. Thank you. <laughs> if all. we can still hug, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, virtual hugs. And thank you all for this chance in this talk um, for all the community that joined and will continue to join. And thank you, Deborah Galila Asmarat, for all you do. You um, inspire me every day. Um, so no, thank you all. Thank you, seriously. Um, super honored to be a part of it. Galila, you know, you're my heart. She's my inspiration, my sound, but always, Dian, you always inspire. Deborah, you always inspire. I'm so um, th just thankful for everything you do and for always uh, teaching me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm learning so much from you guys too. So thank you. The same, thank you. Again, it, it feels really good to know there's a community that has a same mind, a uh, similar mind as you. It just makes you feel a lot more sane. <laughs> and also, uh, like you said, uh, Tian, it's you. It's we are we have power in in together in many of us. So thank you. This was such an inspiring uh, conversation. Keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, ladies. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, everything will be uh, live. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye.